Here we are. Thanks, Mark, for taking the time. My pleasure. I have you on tons of recordings. And <laughs> so I was like, man, yeah. we should do that. So, you know, and okay. uh, I love, I've loved your playing, uh, you know, oh, with thank you. so many people. And, uh, uh, you know, I've done this talk with Paul Dunmore like a couple of months ago. Yes, and, I saw it. Yeah. You know, I love Paul and you, you guys. I, I listened to Unity the other day, which which mm. sounds incredible. You know, I love ever since Coltrane, the duo saxophone drums. That's amazing. And you guys seem to have such an amazing Unity connection going on. And uh, what, what's your story with Paul? When did you guys uh, start playing together? And I know you've done like 30 records because Paul records everything, I think. so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, does a lot of recording and and releases with the uh, FMR. You know, did yeah. fifty box set. Yeah, and now I think he's getting towards the next fifty. I think he's not far off. Um, yeah, I go back to Paul with um, it with Paul Rogers. So when I left home, I moved into a house full of musicians, and Paul Ridge, Paul Rogers lived upstairs. Mm. So um, I was used to this music pretty young, you know. Um, I was in Liftfield rock bands and then I found this music. And then, um, so Paul started a duo with Paul Dunmore. The Paul, two Pauls together did this record called Folks. And it was folk music because Dunmore had that link with folk music. And they were playing together with Tenor Tonic with Alan Skidmore and Tony mm. Levin. And that, right. that, that started and then Musician with Keith Tippett. So yeah, it was all very sure. exciting. In meanwhile, they started this duo called Folks and released this record that just blew me away because uh, I was listening to a lot of folk music, not so much English, but music around the world, you know. Oh, really? Wow. This is really worth checking out. Beautiful. Beautiful. I, I don't know. I don't know this one. I mean, I have so much stuff in my phone, but I don't know this one. Yeah, it's, it, it's out now. Uh, I think it came out on Eminem eventually, but mm. it was a cassette. <laughs> I mean, you know. Um, but I played it a lot. I played it to all my friends and, you know, everyone loved it. And then, uh, yeah, and then they go off improvising around these tunes absolutely you know and incredible players obviously oh. so i wanted to play with them more and uh, like lots of people do but um you know and i got the chance every now and again and um played with paul rogers groups that included dunmore mm -hmm. and um and uh, toured with, with that and got to know dan and then um 1990 he was in a group called Spirit Level, which toured endlessly, sort of, sort of culture, post cold train. Mm. And um, Dunn was leaving as I was joining, kind of thing. Um, he, I did his last gig with the band, basically. And oh, okay. um, so I, I said to him, Gosh, you know, was I too, too loud in that? He said, The drums can never be too loud for me. I was like, Gosh, yeah, yeah, that's. It's quite something easy. Just always just go for it. Go for it. Play. Yeah. And um and then we 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 um I think he asked me to do guitar tri a trio with um John Adams, guitarist, amazing guitarist, session player. Mm -hmm. I know. Okay. Yeah, no, he 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 kind of left the scene, um, but he was playing a lot with Indian musicians in India. Really? Uh, oh, well. Yeah. Remarkable guitarist, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, really, yeah. Uh, we did a record on Hat Art, which was an offshoot from Hat Hut, mm -hmm. and um, did a few things. Uh, yeah, we did Ulrichsburg mm -hmm. Festival, and yeah, a few gigs, and then John sort of moved away from the, the scene a bit, mm. and uh, we came, um, yeah, bits and pieces with Rogers and various people, yeah. And just carried it on. And then one day I went, okay, we've done a bagpipes and drums, but let's do it, you know. Yeah. Let's do it. And um, I sent the recording to 577. 
and uh, they went before I'd, about half an hour after I sent it. They said we're listening to it. Yes, so um, beautiful. Yeah, I mean they've been great, very supportive. Yeah, um, yeah. So it carries on. Um, we did something the other day with a great trumpet player and recording engineer for um, Alex Bonney, electronics, trumpet, and oh, wow. invited me and Paul to play with. Him. Beautiful. It carries on. Yeah. How do how do you approach a duo concert or a duo recording with saxophone? That you, you, I mean, when I listen to you play, it's like you create always like a story, even if it's like a twenty-seven minute improvisation. It's somehow mm. you find the right ways. I mean, you both do, of course, but especially if I listen, uh, I was focusing on drums, like you know, listening to your music in the last couple of days and weeks, and like always, there's this arc. Like, how, how do you focus on a free improv with? Let's say Paul or, or whoever John Butcher. I mean, it's like I listen to yeah. your stuff with John. You're you know? trying to create, yeah, whoever it is, you're you're trying to create a, a story, a, a a beautiful trying to create a beautiful piece of music. So you're making trying to concentrate on what is the right decision and what's where are they going? Where should we go next? That's the one, you know. But without changing too much um, or coming back to the idea. Mm. All, all sorts of ways, but really just deep listening and thinking about trying to create a beautiful piece. Yeah, whatever it is. Whatever well, what's it is. the right decision? Experience, I was tells you that. Yeah. Oh, that's a good. Good answer. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and 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 uh, confidence, which uh, yeah is always a search for the right. Right level of uh, of uh, confidence to just play, you know, as long as it's with your ears and with your heart. And, yeah, that's yeah, that's I, it, really. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I get I get that with you. That you, when you when you enter a certain situation, you you're basically there. It's not like this, you know, whether should, I should go in or not. Or, or I think you just like that's what you said. Confidence, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, sometimes I feel like I'm trying to tie two, if there's a trio, or I'm trying to tie two people together and be in the middle. Um, it can be, uh, I quite like playing in that situation where you, you're playing with people who aren't confident, free improvisers, great musicians, but wanting to improvise. There's a lot of jazz players, you know, oh, I play sure. with at the, mo at the moment. There's musicians I'm playing with at the moment who want to play free. Oh, I want some of this, you know. And then when it comes down to it, hmm, okay. And they might even uh, even say to me, you know, well, so you know, after the first time, well, damn, that was hard, you know. And I said, well, yeah, yeah, but just just play yourself, be who you are, but play it freely. Just take one step at a time, one note at a time, one phrase at a time, and. Uh, and I feel like I'm there, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's great. Let's tie that together with, you know, it can be hard. I've been doing a bit of that lately. Oh, really? Oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, there's a, a guy sort of from the rock scene, and uh, Mark Springer, he's from uh, classical. Yeah, he was in a band called Rick Rig and Panic, and a beautiful um, player, and but not a free improviser. And Steve Fishwick, beautiful trumpet player, great mainstream sort of thing, but. And really, right in the middle of these two guys, very disparate talents, you know. How do you make that work? You know. Yeah. Yeah. You know, your ears are going. Yes. Okay. Okay. Confidence, right? Let let it go. Just play, and trust your ears. Yeah, that's interesting, right? Even if you listen to classical players, and they're so used to sheet music. And technically, of course, they are whatever instrument they play. They're amazing because to play, let's yeah. say, modern classical or whatever. You have to be really good, but then you tell them to freely improvise. It's just like what? And mm, mm. The, many of them cannot do it because they're just used to their focus, different focus. Yeah, yeah. It's, and it's, I, I did think about Derek Bailey in this because th that's something that Derek loved. He didn't want regular groups. He wanted he wanted those awkward moments <laughs> to see how people got through that. And he said, "I feel that he thought that that was." 
I don't want to speak for him, but that's where the, the really interesting music was made, was Ooh, what happens now? Where, where, what do I do now? What, what, how, do, how far do I have to dig? Yeah, well, to, yeah. you know, yeah. and going to the company, Derek Bailey Company Weeks, and watching him do that, put people together, death metal guitarists with double bass. You know, it's fantastic, fantastic. Yeah. yeah. What, what yeah. was the first time you saw him, Derek? By the way, Derek, um, Derek. I saw through uh, my kind of the guy who Paul Rogers introduced me to this percussionist called Will Evans, who was a great mentor, I suppose. Yeah. And um, he was playing with Evan Parker and Derek Bailey mm. in their groups, groups. And um, he, I started going to his gigs and um, he did a company week and he would do various gigs around London with, with Derek. So I'd mm. be there watching, you know, wide eyed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, the first time you see Derek, it's not really, you know, it's, it's an experience, you know, you know that uh, it's not like um, seeing Evan the first time and you're blown away by this circular breathing solo. You see Derek, and it's like, yeah, it's different, beautiful, beautiful, yeah. great well, experiences. When did you guys first time play together? Yeah, well, when was that? How, how did that happen? Um. He invited me and Pat Thomas. And, uh, no, sorry. First time was with Phil Durant, I think. Oh, really? Um, okay. Yeah. And he, he, you go, you go and play in his house. Wow. And then, uh, and then I played with him. He ran a little. Uh, it was a wine bar, and he put music on on Sundays. I think it was Sunday afternoons, and you, he'd have various people. First time seeing Steve Beresford with like fifteen instruments spread around the room, and he's just. Walking from instrument to instrument and blowing different things, you know. Yeah, beautiful. Tuba and Monica and stuff, and Derek's just doing Derek's thing. And yeah, uh, he invited me and Pat Thomas. It was early days, it was mid 80s. Mid 80s. Oh, so we were quite and in then, your early 20s, kind of mid 20s. Um, yeah, yeah. But oh. he was very kind and very, uh, very uh, supportive of young players. Yeah, so yeah. important. No, yeah. Okay. Interesting. Well, when did you first like you? You know, you mentioned before ears and listening, but you you also said you listened to folk music. What, mm. what was this trigger that got you into improvised and improvisation primarily? Like, when, when did that moment, if it was like a moment, happen? Or like, especially for drums. I mean, who who were your, I guess, mid seventies talking about? I don't know, John Bonham or someone like. Who are the the main people who got you excited? Actually. Um. The first one was the drummer with Cliff Richard and the Shadows. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, that was in the yeah, the London Palladium going to see and um, yeah, the, what a great drummer! Damn, I wish I could remember his name. But um, yeah, so that was that was something uh, special. And then um, just falling in love with the drums, watching. Yeah, it wasn't Bonham so much as I was blown away later. But um, yeah, it was it was actually Charlie Watts. Mm, really? Oh, yeah. I just love the look of his kit. I love the look of the. He, he didn't change the heads on his drums, you know, like, you know, he was like a jazz drummer. Yeah. yeah. You know, interesting. So, uh, yeah, I was going to see jazz with my dad in in the local pubs, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, I like that. Yeah. That was that was good. I like the drumming. I love the drumming, actually. Yeah. And uh, um, drummers were. Otherwise, um, it was oh, it was, well, it was Keith Moon. Everything it was all about Keith Moon. Absolutely loved Keith Moon. And yeah. you know, he was improvising. He was, you know, he was, he was all over the drums all the time. <laughs> you know, yeah, poor old John Witt Entwistle. You know, <laughs> hey, you know, fantastic. That's that's why they created that kind of rhythm section with lots of playing. Yeah, yeah, know? man, yeah, yeah, really great playing. Did you see him live yeah. also with the Who or? Yeah. I saw saw them live in 1976 at the Ooh, Charlton okay. Football Stadium, and the Who were playing. Keith Moon stood on his drums and did Uncle sang Uncle Ernie. But I mean, you know, I was right at the front, so I had a mm. great view. But in that, I also saw the support band was the Meters. Oh man, that, that, one of my favourite bands, yeah. man! Oh. Unbelievable! That Ooh. I was I. 
probably was as maybe even a bit more excited by seeing that rhythm section, those tunes, Lowell George singing. I mean, completely blown away. New music to me. You know, that was very exciting. Mm. I kind of remember more about that than, than the Who, to be honest, you know, because I'd love the Who and I knew the Who. But boy, oh boy, that was something. So I started trying to investigate that and oh, uh, listening to that music. And uh, I was always into all sorts. Um, same time I discovered Don Cherry in the local library. Had some oh. records in. Oh, what's that funny? Well, I'll have a listen to that because of the cover, you know. And it was Don Cherry, Brown Moss. And then the drumming on that Billy Higgins groove, you know. No. Wow. Frank yeah. Wright. It's Frank Wright screaming in the saxophone. What the hell is that? Fantastic. No. So, yeah, when I left home at 17 to this house full of musicians and Paul was playing that and, yeah, house full of guys who watching TV and they're like, oh, there's Phil on Top of the Pops. You know, it's like, mm. oh, there's Ted Emmett, who was in Paul Rogers' band. Oh, he's on Top of the Pops with the... Uh, Teardrop explodes. It was all very exciting. Yeah. Exciting times. And then got to see Evan Parker with Paul Rogers play with Evan Parker or Stan Tracy or Yeah. 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 Great Brian Spring. Seeing Brian Spring play. British drummers. Fantastic. Yeah. I was very lucky to grow up with these amazing. And John musicians. Stevens also was like still alive then, right? And yeah, no, no. Paul was playing down the low road in a pub called the Plow. Yeah. With John Stevens. John oh, Stevens had a sort of residency there. Trevor Watts, oh. Barry Guy, um, Alan Holdsworth. John Stevens with Alan Holdsworth. Yeah, there's this Amazing. one recording, man. I listened to the other day, and Holdsworth is like, uh, I couldn't believe it. You know, I was like, what? Yeah, yeah, playing through. I mean, he was extraordinary. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. like nothing else. These lines, and, but totally. And I think it was with Barry Guy, if I remember rightly. Yeah, Barry I think Guy. it's Barry Guy. Yeah, and John Stevens and uh, someone else. But shit, I don't know. Yeah, but the, the, just uh, hearing him playing those lines in a free context. Yeah. And just like the best free play ever on guitar. Like, Man, why didn't you? Why didn't you play more like that later? I mean, I, I love his stuff, you know. But like, just to hear more of that style, I was like, oh. yeah. No. I used to play with um, Elton Dean a lot. I mean, he yeah, I know. Of, yeah, yeah. I, I wanted to ask you because it, yeah. Yeah. how important was he for, for and he, he, loved, he, loved, uh, he was. Oh, yeah, absolutely, completely. Um, but later on, I, I moved into his place, I was between places, and uh, uh, he was getting Soft Machine back together and he wanted Holdsworth. Mm. Holdsworth, amazing, absolutely amazing. Yeah, interesting. And he did they got it together, yeah, quite difficult. With him being in California, but yeah, um, no, Elton was really important to me, really. Yeah, I was very lucky. Yeah, um, but was was he the first guy who kind of? I mean, I, I have that album, All the Tradition, and uh, is this is one of the first albums you made, or did you already do stuff before? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. I think the first one was um, first jazz one was um, Spirit Level. Mm. That was on the first FMR release and then then we did um oh no this was on slam wasn't it uh george haslam's label um anyway yeah we did tours with um howard and and paul mm. that was that was amazing yeah but elton elton i met yeah well yeah playing i was playing and i was oh yeah i was offered to if i drove the band they would let me sit in <laughs> and elton was in the band <laughs> He's so, got, they could, so they could drink right <laughs> And I held him to it and I sat in and uh, Elton went, oh, oh, yeah, okay. And then he, he gave me a call, I think, somewhat later. But it started with Phil Durant. It was this thing that I, I recommend to young players in London. It's a bit difficult now that pubs aren't, oh, oh, so many pubs are closed. But you could, Phil Durant and me started playing together and as a duo. And he suggested we book a... Uh, a, a room above a pub and invite guest players. We play our duo, they do a solo, and then we play together as a trio. And mm. Elton was one, and Evan Parker mm. was one. And um, Elton and Evan called me within a week. I think El Evan actually called me the next day. Oh, <laughs> uh, really? Yeah. Oh, wow. 
the next day yeah so this this was in the mid 80s as well how was that um, like the first gig with evan i mean oh i was completely blown away like i say you know you've seen evan K i didn't really i hadn't seen him until i had to play with him wow. which is kind of good really. <laughs> otherwise it'd have been a nervous wreck but uh he he uh he played a solo soprano it's wow. a, a breathing thing and yeah it takes you off on a, yeah, on a journey yeah absolutely yeah he's but so um i also have that confidence of youth of right this is what i do and bang i'm gonna do it now and, <laughs> <laughs> and being a free improviser you know evan i did it with gusto and uh i i think him and elton both like that you know yeah 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 but you mentioned like these pops that was it then if you compare now was it easier in a sense or or i mean it's never easy in this scene but like were there more opportunities for you guys to play or now like for younger musicians i mean elton ran a, a gig in his um, rumors i mean all sorts of fantastic gigs happen there mm. you know um uh, and he would get to play every week if he wanted and i would just put people on you know um incredible some really amazing gigs so you know you get to see all these fantastic visiting musicians and I mean again to see Louis Marlo mm. whenever he, he, he whenever he was around you know he would play and uh that was yeah, incredible, incredible all the great British drummers yeah so, uh, oh. yeah Nigel Morris Nigel Morris you know and he he because I had no money but uh he he really helped me like Will Evans did you know just mm. really supportive drum mess and chops things you know yeah um but there were so many pubs you could do it yeah you could, really hard now it's really hard because all the pubs are there's a third of the pubs they were in london you know um, yeah yeah and there was a scene also, i mean like people audience also came like to gigs and imp impro sessions and yeah 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 yes mm. i mean yes yes absolutely i mean it was very male audience yeah. things have really moved on now right you know because you got it's you know much more mixed and for me it's fantastic because there's more black players playing you know mixed resins you know so uh it, it, it's great i, I mean i'm mean, some of my a lot of my favorite players are women players you know mm. so that is really something you know um Yeah. Uh, it, it's changed a lot. It, it's it's much, much more open now. Uh, yeah. Uh, so the audience is much younger and spread, you know, whereas it was just old geezers with pints sitting there, uh, six or seven of them, you know. <laughs> But it did depend who it was. Interesting. Um, yeah. But uh, John you... Stevens was always running. Oh, really? Oh, gigs, yeah. A lot of places, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He started. He was a great one for making things happen, musically and and um, performance spaces in London. Yeah. Mm. Plow was here, you know, um, and uh, the Duke of Wellington in Dalston. So it was like the first Dalston gig. Mm -hmm. He's in Cafe Otto, Vortex, Servants Court. You know, all these gigs yeah. in the east east end of London. And uh, John was the first one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Plow. Yes. Way, way different yeah i mean interesting yeah i'm really curious like because this 80s it's such in the uk in london such an amazing you know you had that uh loose tubes vibe going on there then you had mm. kind of this improvised scene which was mm. hugely mm. strong uh, you know w w when i listened to you Both yeah. Like, yeah 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 uh, um and then there was people like Pete New, who were kind of the mi in the middle. There was a guy called Pete New. He was in, he's a piano player, great piano player. He's moved to New Orleans now, mm. years ago. But um, he was really into all the music and playing all of it. He loved reggae, he loved jazz, and he loved improv free improvising. Mm. And well, he was very, he was someone, got me around his place, kind of t taught me how to play, kind of, you know. <laughs> okay, just, let's just narrow it down. Yeah, you don't play free improv when you're playing reggae. Just play the groove, you know <laughs> that sort of thing. You know? Here's a monk tune in a groove with a with a reggae feel. Oh yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He was he was a 
great, great, great musician. What, what, was there a division? I mean, uh, in a sense, between the free scene and that kind of other scene, or did you guys play like you know together also in certain contexts? Because I never noticed on records that this happened. So, no, I mean, the free scene and the and the jazz scene did meet when it was all happening in the seventies. Yeah, you know, every, even Ronnie Scott played free. You know, so I was saying that, but um, it did sort of. I mean, the loose tube scene and the improv scene was a real marker, like the good free players who from the jazz world had the ability to play with the mm. the great, the really good players from the loose tube scene. And then, um, and then there was very few really interested in the free scene from the loose tube scene, except for Steve Buckley and Chris Batchelor. Mm, yeah. And they, 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 mix it up tunes and free so i did some with them and a record and tour with um with them that that was really exciting yeah yeah some interesting stuff you know so the crossovers did happen but not a lot mm. and less and less now i think it's it's opening up again and they're they're, they're it's meeting again um uh, through the teaching i'm seeing seeing more and more young players some of them just want hardcore improv Mm, okay yeah ones who don't come to me for the improvising but it's quite a lot of interest from the jazz players into how to free up and how to uh, maybe not take it so far out but you know i want to help them play more freely if they ask me you know yeah if they're um, open yeah then it's coming back and there's more integration now between the two there's great young british players who are definitely into both so yeah. um, the scene is very healthy at the moment, young scene. You know, awesome. Like Robert Mitchell, really sort of a really amazing strong player, Nicky. Uh, they're really interested in the free scene and what, how, and they come to gigs, but don't, you know, and, uh, and are playing great. Mm -hmm. You know, come from such strong. Yeah. It's like uh, always when you, when you say the mixing, I, I think of Kenny Wheeler. You know, oh. he was the master of that, you know, beautiful compositions. And then he could play the, you know, the, the most amazing free solo or whatever. It's like, man. Oh, man yeah. I used to do gigs with him and Paul Roger, with Evan Parker's. Oh, seriously? Oh, monthly. Wow. Yeah, yeah. <sighs> and then he would invite Kenny and uh, that was, wow, joy. Yeah. And I'd get to, I'd drive him home, give him a lift home. Oh, wow. Get to chat. Yeah. Meet his, yeah, it was lovely. Really, really nice. Very, a very, very lovely guy. Yeah. I mean, I, I love his playing and the sound. And Oh, man. Yeah, it was a knockout. Yeah. We all wanted to play with him, yeah. Uh, uh, also, Mark, I wanted to ask you about, you, you, you know, you mentioned Paul Rogers, mm. with whom you have an amazing connection. But then there's, like, John Edwards also. I think with, mm. with John, you've done, like, I don't know, 100 albums probably already. Oh. And, you and guys, he's still going. You know, we're yeah. still doing it. When was the first time you guys hooked up? So uh, Paul Rogers met Sophia Domensic mm -hmm. when they started playing together. And he, he moved to France. About the same time or a bit earlier, I started playing with John Edwards, with uh, Steve Blake and doing working for dancers, his chumleys. Mm, okay. Dance, big hit in the, in the early 90s, mm. late 80s, early 90s. And um, so they asked me to join the group. And um, do the next tour, and I just looked at John and went, "Oh my god, <laughs> oh my god, he's amazing already, amazing." And he's going, "Yeah, I want to do what you do," because they were both come. I didn't know who they were when they asked me, but they I'd recognised them because they used to come to Evan Parker gigs. Mm -hmm. But they were playing this this sort of groove based dance music, brilliant, yeah. brilliant sax, double bass, and cello, and then the cellos mm -hmm. left. I went to one of their gigs on a date. She said, let's go and see this. I sat there and the audience went, whoa, I know them. Oh my God, this music's amazing. And then started playing with John and then, yeah, he just, he worked, uh, he worked very hard and uh, woodshedding and came yeah. out with this, this style, you know. And so Paul left and then John kind of, that was it. People started booking, Varian Weston, I think was the first. Mm, yeah. Trio was 
really took off. And then Evan jumped in and got us together. I'd been saying to Evan, you know, <laughs> you know, John, he's, yeah, and that took off. And then, you know, that was it. Lots of work together. Yeah. Different things. And some amazing things, touring with Evan and Canada. And yeah, it's endless. We're still doing it. Playing yeah, no, your connection, young. your connection is amazing. It's like listening to, you know, those amazing rhythm sections. Like, you know, I don't know, Barry Guy and Paul Lydon or whoever, like, or, you know, even the straight cats, like. Yeah. Uh, yes, I can too, but I won't say who, but, you know, yeah. It's just, it's, yeah. Incredible, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Maybe this Gabriele Mattelli in Italy a lot. It's a new thing. And, uh, yeah, it's a joy. Yeah. Beautiful, right? Yeah. Drinking, eating, drinking together. It's good. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. But the playing's always, yeah, it's always great. Yeah. I'm, I'm, Paul, Paul Rogers is coming over again and we're doing a trio recording with Dunmore again. Oh, man. Yeah. Yeah. So Paul's come, uh, Rogers is coming up and then we go and play with Evan Parker and Nikki Yo. This is fantastic. Pianist, she's put this quartet together with Evan Parker and me and Paul Rogers because she was a big fan of Paul when he was here. So, yeah, um, yeah. Look forward to that in January. Oh, fantastic! Beautiful. Yeah, yeah. How did the connections with American musicians happen? Uh, you know, uh, I mean, I love the trio with Charles Gale that you got, you you and John and Charles Gale season yeah. change and like how did these stories happen or with Ken Vandermark or Russell Rod? Like how did all these connections with the well, Roswell Rudd, Elton, wanted to put a band together and he did this trombone. He went, right, I'm going to do a trombone trio. He'd, be, he'd, done, he'd been in touch with Roswell over the years since doing the Carla Blay band. And they really hit it off. Um, and then he he'd, he'd been asking Roswell and he, Roswell had been saying, I can't, I can't leave my wife, you know, she's not well. Um, and eventually Elton asked again and Roswell, he actually came and stayed with me. So he told me, his son said, go, don't worry, we'll deal with mum. Mm. You just go, dad, go, go to England. So this was his first ventures out again. And uh, cool, he was a mate. I mean, Rather Paul Rutherford and Roswell Rudd and Annie Whitehead together. <sighs> Couldn't go wrong, it was fantastic. Um, yeah. And, and uh, Charles Gale happened, I was playing a lot in Belgium with this guy, Peter Jacquemin, and bass player, Peter Jacquemin, and um, I think they'd invited Charles Gale and me, and Charles just, after the sound check, he just booked me for some gigs in Europe. Oh, wow. Okay. That was it. Beautiful. Yeah, and we hit it off with mates, and yeah, we did quite a lot together. Um, yeah, yeah, no, no, Charles is amazing. Now, we did a tour with William Parker. Oh, wow, um, but really? that's, Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow, okay. Um, and who else? America? I don't know. You know, I mean, John and I, we have that, that reputation and and then people would put us together. John Coxon from Treader with John Coxon, the great guitarist, started to label Treader and he put he put us together. I think he put me and Leo Smith together. Mm. And John Chikai. I did Glastonbury with John Chikai. Do you really? Know? Wow, man. It was amazing. Um, yeah, I mean, John playing with, I think, I don't know who put us together, but Roscoe, we we, we did a, I think actually just Cafe Otto put me and John with Roscoe Mitchell. Really? Oh, man. How Two was days that like? at Cafe Otto. Yeah. Ooh. Oh, that was incredible. Yeah, what a star. You know, he did that. The very first, yeah, yeah. One note for 15 minutes, you know, that thing, that strength of all, using dynamics and colours with one note. What a star. It's like, <laughs> yeah. I mean, hit it off with sitting, yeah, hanging out um, in the kitchen at Otto and chatting, and and so, and there he invited us to do um, was it uh, um, Malou's? I think we did Malou's hmm. festival in France as a trio. That oh. was great. Well, is is that recorded or something yeah. with yeah. Roscoe? No, no, no. I think it's 
Well, Oxford would have recorded it. I don't think they released it. Um, no, I haven't done released anything with Oscar. Oh. I have with 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 Wadada, you know, Smith, and um, yeah. Amazing, man. Yeah. I mean, it, I'm with John, you know, and there's some, um, and of course with John Butcher, that trio with John Butcher. Oh man, yeah. In the morning, you know, blimey, yeah. wanted that to happen for so long, and then, yeah, it, it started, it started. I, I think I called up John Butch to come and do a duos with me. Yeah, in like, Birmingham, and then we did a, a duo record, and then the timing was was right to do the trio with John Edwards. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. I listened to Tariff Cuts, your duo with John, like you, you guys released. Yeah. yeah, that was an experience, that was a fantastic. Ooh. I mean, that's that. Oh, I mean, that's John as a composer that he never thought he'd be a composer, but actually, he's a brilliant composer. And it's Graham McKenzie at uh, Huddersfield New Music Festival. Yeah. I made that happen. John had got a grant to, or a, a asked to um, put a piece together, there was a complete. A collector of all Arabic music, so mm. Arabic guy, Arab guy, and he collected all Arabic music. And they invited artists to delve into the his collection online and make a piece. And John did that, and then he re revisited it using pieces as backing tracks. So beautiful Arabic singing and drumming and yeah. all, all stringed instruments, and um, me and him improvising along. And then we did. Did beautiful gigs around you know, Brazil and Holland, Barcelona. Oh, really? Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Doing that. And uh, Lebanon. We went to the Lebanon with it. Oh, wow. Playing in front of all these musicians. Like, wow. Yeah. Yeah. It was quite something. But they loved it. You That's know? incredible. Yeah. yeah. John's, John's interest, but Yeah. Yeah. I'm doing this, this interview John's with him in two weeks. I'm really looking forward to do that. Oh. Yeah. Oh. To ask him some oh, questions. Yeah, he's a great. You read. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Lovely. Oh, uh, I wanted to ask you one, one, one thing. You know, you've played with so many musicians and uh, co-led bands. Uh, did you have you ever thought about leading a group, or have you already yeah. led a group, or what's in that yeah. department? Yeah. So um, the first thing I did was a few years ago, and um, it really turned into something. It was, um, I, I did, I'd, I'd been um, reading a lot of Langston Hughes and Ooh. various writers and artists, James Baldwin, big fan. Yeah, and, yeah Claude, Claude McKay and all those people. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. Stuff. So I, we did a, I did a trio with, I was sorry, we did a quartet, Matana Roberts was playing Cafe Otto. We did some gigs, Robert Mitchell on piano, Neil Charles on bass and myself. Oh, wow. And we went we should do this trio again you know because Matina comes and goes and uh, we didn't know she was going to move to London but anyway we um, we we said let's do a trio and I, I thought about it I thought I really want to do this but I want to just do another piano trio you know my great friend and promoter um, supporter a, a Birmingham promoter Tony Dudley Evans sure. it's been incredible help a, incredibly supportive um, and he's an amazing promoter and he said Oh, so many piano trios, so many piano trios. I thought, let's do something different. Okay, we'll do it, uh, we'll do it. Um, I came up, right, let's do a gig, the three of us with a few guests, not so, so, so horn-based. Right, let's do it with singers and explain like, so Elaine Michener, Cleveland Watkiss, Elaine Michener's an amazing classical bass singer mm. and artist oh, movement. And Cleveland Watkiss, who's an incredible jazz singer and drum and bass and improviser, free improviser. And um, and then my sister, Debbie Sanders, who's a storyteller and singer. Oh, really? So then to come along, bring some writing that you like from black poetry, black prose. And we kind of did it where I would say, right, you on, start a duo with piano and Debbie doing a story and piano, you know and then just sort of kind of um guiding it but it was improvised and that was that went really well and mm. that that's a few ideas from other from the performers to start their own thing um 
using poetry. Neil just did a great piece mm, um, by Langston Hughes, and um, yeah, that was that was good. Anyway, so did that, and then during the pandemic, uh, Tony Dudley Evans had always asked me to do something with some Birmingham musicians, and um, I'm so busy doing my own thing, I uh, doing other people's music. I, yeah. Me organise it. I can't bear organising gigs. No, it's, it's really the idea. No, no, I don't. I don't need to. Don't want to. But this was an opportunity, and I wanted to do something with the electronics. I love playing with the electronics. Oh. So I wanted to. Yeah. So I asked Chris Mapp, who's a bass player here, great bass player, electric bass mainly now, and pedals. Mm. So you, you, you know, it's just the electronics really. Yeah. And then. Uh, and then Andrew Woodhead, who's a piano player here, and um, electronics as well. So we we started working on that, doing some rehearsing and ideas. I had ideas I wanted, just a few ideas. And then we recorded a, an online thing, and then we recorded an album. And oh, really? I, okay. Yeah. And that's coming out on 577. It's sort of due out very soon. And I did solo, a couple of solos on it. With percussion, with a big horizontal bass drum and gongs, where I'm just playing. I mean, it's all improvised in the studio. It's not no overdubs. Um, oh, well, fantastic! Uh, and 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 then three tracks with them. And I'm just trying out different ideas of. In the pandemic, I was looking at my. You know, you go over what you've done in your. You when you're not gigging, you think about what sure. do I do? What do I like? Uh, and I start and I and I just started practicing things with. Um, just very slow grooves oh. that can uh, that that can that can, that can uh, aren't particularly going anywhere, but just playing with the electronic sounds and um, so I had to go at that and and then very free playing and the usual playing that I'd love to do mm -hmm. with electronics um, and uh, I was very happy with it. I'm really happy with it. It's it's, it's different. But it is, it, I'm, I'm very happy about it, and uh, I love what they do. And I wanted to carry on with Chris uh, and play with guests. You know, me and Chris, Matt, plus guests playing. Yeah. Players. So we've got, we've got one coming up. So that's my kind of lead thing, led by me. And um, we're doing something at Ch Cheltenham with Stian Westerhaus. Oh, yeah, Cheltenham. really? Oh, wow, yeah. that will be cool. Yeah. yeah. We got one that uh, we did one with a dancer uh, in Birmingham. That was lovely. Yeah, contemporary oh, dance and then contemporary dance. Wow. So um, yeah, we got that. We got another one with that. And there's lots of people I'd love to do it with. You know. Yeah. Um, and then uh, another thing I led. This is again recently. This, this was very recently. Was um, Shrike Records label in london asked me to do something uh, and said would you mind would you do it with john we'd love to have you and john on, on our things and i as soon as he said it i kind of thought i've always wanted to play with high lem kim she plays the tagam the korean flute yeah fantastic improviser i'd done a little thing with the peter weigold's gigs um with which was brought together all different musicians from different scenes classical and jazz uh, and improvising, and um, Highland was on one. She knocked me out. Absolutely, <laughs> listening to her, not you know. Yes. So, so we did that. We recorded that, and that's coming out soon. Oh, wow, fantastic! So, wow, okay, cool. Yeah, suddenly I'm leading. Stuff. <laughs> yeah. Um, Mark Sanders trio does Europe like a three week tour, you know, like. <laughs> oh, well, it'll be a joy. I mean, to do do. Um, I mean, you, yeah, to do all those things. Yeah, yeah, one of those things. Yeah, but not really. <laughs> Being a band leader and running a tour. Oh God, I've done that, and uh, yeah. Yeah, I know. I know. It's the because I take the responsibility seriously. You know, making sure everyone's fed and comfortable, and when we get there, is everything right? And um, I remember that with Tim Richards with Spirit Level because he mm. would organize everything, and it'd be a ten-day tour, and he could. He, when it got to coming on stage, oh, now I've got a play. You haven't done that. I've had that bloody, that blooming drummer winding me up. <laughs> when are we eating? 
<laughs> where are we going? Where we... I don't like my route, you know, all that stuff I did when I was young, you know. Yeah. No, no. I know exactly. I, I had like a three week tour almost like in October now, and I was the band leader. And, you, you know, it was with uh, Ariel Thunderson and Bob Moses, who are like 70, oh, 77, right. right? Right. And I had to like exactly this, you know, I, I, I was driving, I was talking with the promoters, helping setting up, helping, of course, carry the equipment because, you know, they're older. So. Then, you know, like dinner, blah, 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 everything, uh, selling CDs. In between, yeah. I also kind of played music. So <laughs> it's like, man, yeah. it's... It's not easy. No. I, I, I could have swore I'd never do it again. I did a few Tony Dudley Evans, very, again, supportive. He put the money together for a few tours here. One with Charles and William, um, Barry Guy, and um, mm. uh, I did the one with Bro the first one I did was with Brotsman and John. Really? Yeah, oh. I was that all on my own without any support. Ooh. And uh, it was a bloody nightmare. <laughs> yeah, you get on stage and you're supposed to play. Exactly. And, you're, and your soul is going, oh, God, what did I say to so and so? Oh, God, oh, you know, what have I got to do after this? Right, how do we get to the hotel? <laughs> exactly, yeah. It's. Oh, my God. Yeah. I kept swearing, I kept swearing, I'm not doing this again. But uh, yeah. I'm the same, but then, then six months after this horrifying experience, I'm like, hmm. So what are we going to do next? <laughs> it's it's like an addict, you know, or something. Mm. Terrible. Well, but looking yeah. forward to these new albums of of yours, uh, like Lead. I'm really look, really curious how they sound. So yeah, no, well, it, yeah, beautiful. Yeah, what you think? Yeah. But uh, otherwise, uh, Mark, just not to take more of your time, like, uh, w w what are your plans for the upcoming months? I mean, I know you said in January you, you have some upcoming gigs and uh, with Paul and Evan, but like, what's on the schedule until the summer or probably a lot, right? Gosh, yeah. What am I doing next week? I don't remember, you know. Um, I, I, yeah, quite, um, is Gabriele Mitelli the... The trio with that is really hoping to take off and um there's a great singer who uses electronics francesca bauman mm -hmm. um um she's in switzerland and trying to get stuff together for that um she's organizing stuff for that so um, gosh you, know, you people are gonna be cross saying mark we're doing a tour <laughs> in two weeks time <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not remembering. I, I haven't got a diary first hand. I, I don't know. Just more of the same. Lots of different people and uh, having a great time. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Cool. Well, if you're ever around my area, let me know. Give me, drop me a line and we'll where, get where together. Are you? I'm in Slovenia, Maribor, like south of Graz. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Near Ljubljana. So one hour from Ljubljana. So. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Smashing. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Would be great yeah. to pl play one day. So. Oh yeah, no, no. Well, I will. You know, we'll keep it up. See, and I haven't said anything. I mean, I just don't remember to do these things. So. <laughs> but that would be. I'd love to. Yeah. 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 So whenever you're around, let me know. Maybe we can. I can hook up something here. If you're close, you know, if you have a day off or something or two. Or... Same with London or England. If you're coming, I'm not in London. I'm in Birmingham, but you know, I'm in London. Yeah. Seems like every other day. <laughs> <laughs> cool. But Mark, thanks so much. I really appreciate it. Pleasure. Sharing some thoughts. So, and uh, yeah, okay, mate. well, have a good holiday break. Um, yeah, you too. And yeah, yeah. Oh, god, it's John Butcher. You see, John Butcher's booking gigs, and I, <laughs> John, he didn't forget you. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, cool. Yeah, cool. Happy, great. Thanks, Mark. Yeah. You too. Cheers. Happy holidays. Cheers. Thanks. Bye. Cheers. Mm -hmm.